Uh oh. Welcome to Glitchwire. This show is all about uncovering the glitches that are dramatically altering the way we understand the world and how we exist within it. I'm your host, Marissa True. Today's guest is Robbie Young, the CEO of Animoca Brands. So, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you. So, Robbie, you're the CEO of Animoca Brands, a game software company and VC focused on building the open metaverse, as well as delivering digital property rights to the world's gamers and internet users. But before we get into that, I'd like to focus the conversation on you for a while. Uh, my research actually tells me that you come from a very diverse industry background, spanning media, tech, telecommunications, primarily around Asia. And it sounds like the kind of blend of experiences that would prime you very well for a blockchain space as an emerging tech sector. So to start off with, I think it's a fairly typical question, but do you actually recall your red pill moment where blockchain and crypto just made you know, too much sense for you to ignore? And you know, where were you and what were you actually doing? Sure. Um, so I think, you know, um, I, I came to the space relatively late. I spent my whole career in what, what the bankers like to call TMT, as you mentioned, telecom media and technology, um, with the majority of it doing internet related stuff. Um, you know, the first web one in, in the 90s um, uh, with a web development business um, all the way through to, you know, the last little over a decade in, in gaming. <clears throat> um, and of that period, um, since 20, late 2017, um, we've been focused on the intersection of blockchain and games. And I think that, you know, we got into it as like, like many people in the gaming space and in tech generally, we're always looking for ways to innovate. And when, you know, markets start to saturate or costs go up, um, we try to find new ways and new niches, whether it's content or technology or distribution or something like that. And so as mobile gaming matured um, through the course of 2016 uh, and into 2017, we were experimenting with lots of new things. And one of those experiments ended up being blockchain. Um, and we were fortunate enough to work with a team that was um, basically a, come, came out of a hackathon project uh, in Canada and they were experimenting with the idea of tokenizing in-game content, um, so creating unique tokens. And so they wrote um, the ERC-721 standard, and this was the team that later became known as Dapper Labs. Um, and so they did this for the purpose of creating a game, which we um, worked with them on and published in Greater China called CryptoKitties. And this was at the end of 2017. So having worked on that game with them and kind of observed I think, and and tried our best to learn about blockchain from them. I think that experience transformed my thinking completely about, like, I didn't really understand. I, you know, to me, blockchain was about crypto until that point, um, and it was this idea of the NFT that I think really caught my imagination because it was the excitement of being able to actually confer ownership over a digital object to somebody. Um, and that's groundbreaking because I'd spent, you know, the better part of 25 years trying to trying to propagate digital content in all kinds of different fashions, whether it was websites or TV or magazines, you name it. And we always had these, the same problem, which is there was no digital copyright management that works. And so you weren't able to, you know, you couldn't share music files with your friends or whatever it was because there was no way to track royalties, etc., we know all the problems. And here was an opportunity for a new technology that may actually solve that problem. And that was really exciting. And for us as gamers, it, um, it was very straightforward because we felt like, well, you know, actually, if we just tokenize in-game currency as, you know, a fungible token, and we tokenize in-game content as an NFT, then actually we're delivering precisely the same experience to our customers, to our players and users. They'll just buy virtual currency and spend it to buy virtual items. That's what they've been doing for 15 years. However, they will actually own it now, right? So they'll be able to trade it on a marketplace. They'll be able to send it to their friend. We'll be able to get paid royalties. Like it's basically the same thing, but so much better. Um, and you know, and and that was that was my red pill moment, as you called it. Um, and I think it was so for the rest of the firm as well, because, you know, we 
at that point made the decision not to make any more games without blockchain because once you know you can't unsee this once you have the idea of ownership of content in games why would you ever tell your customers again that you're selling you're selling them something or they're buying something but they don't really own it it's just not fair I mean, with that eureka moment, I think what's interesting is that many people find it challenging to understand or have a true feeling of the sense of ownership over a digital item. They understand it in principle and on an intellectual level, but in terms of sort of the saliency of that feeling, it's left many people a little unsure or hesitant to engage with it just because it is such a foreign concept. And so when you, like, when you see that kind of gap in understanding how did your perspective shift because you're going from you know this this notion of digital ownership almost like a almost like the principle of digital ownership to something that's very feasible achievable and sellable how did you how did you kind of reconcile that gap in your mind sure um i don't think there is a gap and i think the easiest way to look at that is it if you think of where crypto comes from it comes from fintech originally and so if you look at a very simple example, you know, owning a share in a company, um, if you own a, you know, stock um, or a stock certificate, m the majority of people in the world have bought stocks and shares without ever touching a physical stock certificate. Um, you go online onto a website, you buy something, it shows it as a, you know, in your account that you own it and that's it. And, and frankly, money is kind of the same these days. And yet... And to me, that sort of belies the idea that just because you can't touch it doesn't mean it's not real and you don't own it. Um, and and that, you know, it, in fact, you know, the home that you live in is more defined through ownership that's on a digital record somewhere than it is by the fact that you physically sit in it. <laughs> um, and so I think I think from that perspective, for me, that idea of ownership was not something that was difficult to bridge. I think the tricky part, frankly, is for younger people. Because when I look at my colleagues who are in their 20s, it occurred to me not long ago um, that I have colleagues probably almost to the age of 30 who have never actually purchased a piece of media in their lives. They have no idea what it actually means to purchase some type of intellectual property created by another human because all they've done is subscribe to a, a you know, fire hose of content for their entire adult lives. And so that I can see how that would be a trickier gap to bridge um, in the same way that people for a while talked about, you know, when, when ride sharing be first became very, very popular, people talked about, oh, well, we're not gonna need to own cars anymore because we'll all just take, you know, ride sharing services. Um, I think that we're, you know, we're not quite there yet. Um, and I think there are lots of reasons why. Um, but I think the main one, and again, this is sort of what is exciting about NFTs and digital content, um, ownable content as well, is, is asset value. Because at the end of the day, um, you can consume services and they um, can serve the purpose of the same thing. The ride sharing gets you from point A to point B and listening to you know your favorite streamed song on spotify achieves you listening to that music but you cannot create asset value so mm -hmm. you know like with the transport with the transport example you continue to take rides every day but when you have an automobile that is something that is an asset that has value and you can buy it you can sell it you can mortgage it you know etc it's interesting because the notion of a very media content rich but free and open internet posing as an more of a challenge for a younger generation to grasp the principle of value over a digital item is interesting because i think that's actually i would more often hear the opposite end of the argument which is older generations not understanding what the principle of digital value is so this <laughs> is this is a this is an interesting mirror of that argument which is is very valid and i think well because you know, also it's... if you think of if you th like sorry to interrupt you I, I i grew up in an age where you know i started on let's use music as, as an example so i started on vinyl right i'm that old mm -hmm. um and uh and throughout 
all of the different format changes. It was all about, you know, what music companies and distribution companies were thinking about. What is the price point at which, you know, where where people will still continue to consume? And in that case, it was always, I don't know, call it 20 US dollars. 15 to 20 US dollars was considered the price point for one hour's worth of music that people would tolerate to pay. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And now when you think about paying half of that for an unlimited supply of most of the music available in the world, like it doesn't, from a pure value proposition point, it's very difficult to think, why would I want to go back to the other system? This streaming seems amazing until you think of it holistically in and ask yourself, well, is this actually sustainable? Because actually, you know, look at how the creators of the content are being treated. Um, does it allow for innovation? Does it allow for, you know, all kinds of different things? Just the same way that during the pandemic, we thought, well, maybe in-person meetings are going to be a thing of the past because actually, you know, look how much we're getting done on Zoom. But as we've seen, you know, the world is not um, as straightforward as logic sometimes dictates. We're human, we have emotions, we have all kinds of other things. And hey, we like to get out and go to a conference, it seems. I mean, the irony of us recording online at the moment isn't lost on me at all. <laughs> and I think also this notion of digital value creation and ownership often lends itself more to the side of the creator because obviously the creator is going to understand the value of their contributions you know, to, to a digital world, a physical world, wherever, whatever it may be. But then the price sensitivity of the person on the other end of that equation is what kind of muddies the water a little bit. Because what we can't ignore is, I guess, the blockchain and crypto space is very financially motivated, as it were. And, you know, I mean, the, I mean, the octon set of blockchain was a prime example of, you know, a massive glitch in our system. First, crypto spotlighted the pitfalls of our global financial system via the Bitcoin white paper. Second, NFTs spotlighted what ownership over digital assets should look like. And then we saw a huge boom in interest over NFTs, particularly in the artists and creator spaces. And then we had, you know, the boom of play to earn gaming and people understanding that gaming could actually be a monetizable activity. But before we get into all of that, can we talk about what makes Web3 Gaming Web3 Gaming? Uh, sure. Um, <clears throat> I think very simply, it sh there should be no difference from the perspective of the entertainment angle. You come to a game to have fun. I think the idea of a game in Web3 that's different from a game in Web2 is purely the function of ownership. Um, and the idea that your content um, can be owned and that as a result of your game being largely built on open standards, um, it also means that you have the potential to have content that's interoperable, uh, as well as the value that's encapsulated in, in soft currencies inside your game, um, also potentially be interoperable with, with other game economies. So the, from a game designer standpoint, it's very different because you're designing an open economy as opposed to a closed economy. But from a player standpoint, no, not that much different, except now I can actually own my stuff. So I have agency over it. I can buy it and sell it. Um, and I can potentially bring it with me from one game to the next. So a lot of the rhetoric around blockchain gaming circulates around this idea of mass adoption. And as, as you rightly said, for the player experience, they shouldn't really necessarily have to be aware of their interaction with NFT technology or uh, blockchain technology that the game is built upon. But this principle of mass adoption is sort of the core tenet of success. Mm -hmm. Before we get into sort of like the merits of how these games work, like why does the world actually need blockchain gaming? Why is it essential to replace sort of the way games have traditionally been built with this interoperable, digitally ownable world? So I think <clears throat> there's a couple of reasons. So um, we'll get to mass adoption in a minute because I have a whole, I have a big problem with that whole term. Um, but I think, um, why does the world need blockchain gaming? I, I don't think it needs blockchain gaming. That, that wouldn't be the way I would put it. But I think that um, to me, the idea of introducing blockchain into games is about equity as in fairness, because 
what we've had is a gaming world for years. Like, if you go back to the way gaming was at the be- at, at its beginnings, you bought gaming on physical media, right? You bought games on cartridges and later DVDs and such. When you own a game cartridge, you purchased that game. It was an upfront price. That was the business model. But interestingly, when you got tired of playing that game, an entire industry of shops grew up where you could go in and trade your game secondhand, your old game cartridges, and you'd sell them at a loss to somebody else, and they would sell them, and you could go to the secondhand shops and buy cheaper, older games. Like There's a whole market for it, just like there is for other physical media, like vinyl records. And that, to me, was you know indicative of the fact that you owned the game. It was yours to buy and sell. Since we moved to digital distribution of content, we ended up in an environment where, because, as we were talking about earlier, there was a lack of copyright protection capability in the technology, we decided that, therefore, all of this stuff, because we can't protect it, is essentially um, worthless. It's free. Um, Because now we have game environments where all of the things that you purchase in the game are subject to the um, rules set out by the game developer, and they're locked within a closed ecosystem. So you as a player continue to pay. And of course, now the, the prevailing business model is not just paying for the game up front, as we used to do with console games, um, but also um, the free to play model where you continue to pay in game to continue to buy new content. But it's you're not really owning it. And at the end of the day, you can't do anything with it. You can't sell it. You can't. And, and I think that in the press coverage, media coverage of blockchain gaming over the past several years, a lot of attention was focused on the idea that people would buy things in games, for example, and they could make money on them. And I think that completely misses the point, because I think the point is actually not to make money. The point is not is that you don't lose all your money, because the way games are sold today, every dollar you spend, that's it. You get fun in return. And I'm not discounting the fun. The fun is great right? But if you actually own it, there should be residual value there. And so if I own that content, just like I did when I bought a video game cartridge 30 years ago, 40 years ago, um, then I should be able to sell it for some diminished value, right? Because I used it. It's a used item. And so why can I not recycle my digital stuff at pennies on the dollar? I think that's very fair to the consumer um, because it honors the promise that you purchased this from it, from me, and you own it. Um, And so I think that's a really, really important part of this idea of digital ownership. And then on top of that, the idea of building games that are built on open standards. And this is where we can start to offer capabilities in games that have not existed previously, um, which is that you can take content and interoperate it from one game to another. So I have, for example, two racing games, and I buy a car in one game, and I kit it out, and I, I you know, I pimp it, and I, I paint it and customize it how I like, and then it's my favorite car, so I can take it from game one to game two to game three. And that's my, rep, you know, everybody in each game knows that's my car, and, you know, and, <clears throat> and that's my identity in the car racing world. And I think from a gamer standpoint, that's really great because we've always had to live in these siloed ecosystems where um, games exist as kind of perfect, complete worlds and don't allow in anybody else. They're essentially, you know, like countries with closed borders and and no, no, uh, no tourism and no immigration. I mean... Yes, absolutely. Because at the same time, we, you know, we can argue that blockchain built games are a very young phenomenon. You know, it still relies on very early stage technologies. There's there's still a lot of kinks that need to be ironed out for this to become, I guess, the, the global standard of games. But at the same time, as this is developing, especially, you know, over the course of a, a, a a crypto bear market where a lot of this activity seems to slow down, or at least a lot of user activity seems to slow down. I can't say the same for the actual developers who are continuing to build these games. But what it seems like is that there is a lot of resistance from traditional gaming communities about 
this, you know, creep into blockchain technology. And it's interesting to me because I would have thought that, you know, gamers that are most familiar with these in-game economies that you're speaking of, and this, this notion, not necessarily of extractive value, but of perpetual value, would understand the, mm -hmm. these principles better than anyone else. Yet, I don't think it's necessarily down to a lack of education, because it also seems that even those that understand the tech seem to be resisting it. So with that in mind, where do you think, you know, this resistance is coming from and what do you think it's going to take to overcome? So I think that um, the idea that there's a lot of resistance is a, is a little bit of a lazy narrative. Um, I think what there is in reality is a very vocal but small minority because it's a little bit like politics and social media. You hear, you know, there are very loud voices, but they're often in the minority and they just mm -hmm. enjoy being loud. Um, I think the gaming community and people who play games largely, um, uh, the ones who are most, there's a, there's a small minority of people in gaming who tend to be resistant to change, um, you know, just because it's a big cross section of humanity. And I think we've seen this um, throughout different evolutions of games um, in general. There was a tremendous amount of resistance, particularly amongst Western game players, to the free to play business model in games. They thought that the idea was that you paid for a game and that was it. And then you have fun and you play it forever and you never pay again. And the idea of continuing to pay inside a game for anything. Um, regardless of value offered, um, was just anathema to them. And yet now we see, you know, five, ten years later, that basically free-to-play is, is the standard model of gaming, including on console games, which were largely the platform considered to be the, you know, buy-and-forget kind of platform of games. Um, but free-to-play actually is something that's been voted on by players. You know, players in all markets around the world prefer the free-to-play model because they like this idea of being able to customize their content by buying new skins and new new customizations or being able to buy new levels or new worlds to add on content add-ons into their games, and they're happy to pay for that. Um, and it's also better for developers because it allows them to have an ongoing revenue stream from the game. <clears throat> so it's actually a better business model for gaming generally. Um, and I think that, you know, we also saw a lot of resistance to mobile. So lots of game developers who came from console and PC resisted mobile because they thought that the idea of having a very small screen was very anti-gaming. They said nobody would ever play games on such a small screen because the experience is subpar. Um, when in fact, what we've seen in hindsight is that actually mobile has been probably the biggest technological benefit to the game industry. You know, it more than doubled the size of the game industry in the last decade. Um, but what we did see was that the innovation in mobile gaming came largely from companies um, that were relatively unknown before mobile. You know, so you think of Rovio with Angry Birds or Supercell with Clash of Clans. Um, King with Candy Crush, all of these biggest titles on mobile over the over the last decade all came from companies who were not the incumbent um, sort of behemoths of console and PC gaming. <clears throat> and I think we're going to see the same in blockchain, frankly, because it's very difficult as a as a major incumbent to pivot your business and your business model completely to embrace what is kind of a new paradigm. So what we're really actually saying is that it's not necessarily resistance to blockchain technology and principle, the principle of NFTs, but just resistance to change overall. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very interesting what you're saying about, you know, it's almost like a very linear thinking in the Western market about you purchase the game, you play the game and the game is finished. And that's where that's where it rests forever unless you sell it on. Meanwhile, mobile adoption, and this is a perfect time to bring in how different it is in Asia is what has led to a completely different sort of path to activity within the gaming space. And as you said rightly, that many of the incumbents didn't adapt to the new format and succeed there, though I'm sure they did over you know the course of time. But the real winners were those that built for the platform that they were choosing to display on natively. And so 
it becomes this very interesting idea of sort of, you know, what it takes to build a very successful blockchain game, mm -hmm. like a blockchain based game. Because I think, I think, you know, with the NFT boom and bust with the bull market to the bear market, you know, the general market cycle, as it were, because I'm very optimistic that it will return. But one thing that has been very clear in the discourse is that many have been disappointed by, you know, the quality of the gameplay that exists on blockchain so far. You know, you do have a few clear examples of game design that's a little bit more complex and sophisticated, but a lot of the enthusiasm rested more around things like the earning potential of the game, which, you know, rightly or wrongly is something that does matter to people, uh, rather than, you know, the pure playability of the game. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, we have to admit that crypto communities are notoriously impatient when it comes to generating their returns. But all this being said, Anamoka is quietly, build, quietly and patiently building this portfolio of, from <clears throat> what I last checked, was over 450 games and companies and counting. So when, this is perhaps a slightly unfair question, but like, when do you see this maturation of the gaming standard taking place in this blockchain arena? So I think, um, first of all, it takes many years. Um, and so I think if you look back to, um, if you look back to the development of the most recent platform, which was mobile, um, <clears throat> um, I'd say that the moment when mobile gaming really kind of um, reached its tipping point um, and became something that everybody thought about um, was with the launch of Angry Birds. Most people can't remember mobile games before Angry Birds. Um, and Angry Birds came out three years after the App Store launched. Um, so there were three years, and, and the App Store came out a year after the iPhone. Don't forget, there was there was the original iPhone was around for a year before the App Store launched. So you just had the apps that came with the phone, um, which is kind of a funny concept at this point in time. And um, and so for three years, people played games and they paid for downloads because those games were distributed in the traditional model of you know pay. 9.99 or 6.99 and you own the game and that's it and you don't get more content that's it buy once that's it um and then the free-to-play model started to bleed over from asia and angry birds came out and then after angry birds we got subway surfers and then we got candy crush and the industry never looked back um, and it also really opened up the market for casual games um, casual games had been played on on pc before um, but were not nearly as big. And casual games also happen to be um, uh, very much enjoyed by female audiences. So it helped to really onboard um, a very large audience of female gamers who were underserved with the kind of content that was available before. Um, and so mobile was the perfect platform for this. You know, So all of a sudden, particularly in cities around the world where people have long commutes, mobile gaming, uh, casual games took off. <clears throat> um, I think that when it comes to blockchain gaming, um, the games take a while to distribute, uh, to, uh, sorry, to develop, I should say. Um, if you're thinking about things like um, very high-end AAA uh, type content, um, a, triple, a decent AAA game will take you at least three years to develop. Um, you know, it's like m making a blockbuster film. Uh, we have two out at the moment. Um, and the reason that we have two out is because the development actually preceded our involvement with blockchain. So, so they've been in development for many years. Um, it takes a long time to make content like that. Um, I think where we will see some of the best rapid adoption amongst blockchain games is going to be on mobile platforms. Um, we've had limited success already um, with uh, more casual content on mobile. But the challenge on mobile is distribution. And the two oligopoly platforms of mobile distribution being controlled by Apple and Google, um, let's just say, have not exactly embraced the idea of blockchain games. Um, I think they're a bit um, they're a bit conflicted within their own organizations as to how best they want to um, accommodate the way that their business model needs to evolve in order to um, move from an entirely closed quasi-monopolistic environment to something more open, um, which is what something that blockchain does very well. And I think for them, this, you know, gaming content is kind of a Trojan horse for blockchain sort of weaving its way throughout 
content on their platforms. Um, and so they've been they've taken a long time to try to figure out how to accommodate that. As we saw, you know, Apple came out with some guidelines around blockchain content in the autumn of last year. I think it was autumn, fourth quarter. Um, and Google has just done so now. And yet, you know, people making blockchain games have been doing it for three or four years already. Um, and they've only just come out with their earliest forms of um, guidelines for their app stores of how they want to treat this content. And and they still, I think, in my opinion, have further to go um, and more clarification to do to make it, you know, a more accommodating and hospitable place for, for blockchain game developers. <clears throat> so in the absence of those distribution platforms, um, it becomes much more challenging to find audiences of hundreds of millions of users for blockchain game titles. Um, and in fact, many of the traditional game distribution channels have been actively hostile to games that include blockchain um, technology. And I think that the main reason for that actually is about control. Um, because, and, and this is not, this is not, and I don't say that as a, you know, conspiracy theory of, oh, they're just trying to control us. I mean, control because also, um, it's more difficult to, uh, to, it's more difficult to weed out bad actors as well, because it's an open system and that's inherent in open systems that the benefits of openness also come with an increased cost of being open to, bad actors acting badly. And so you need to have different types of systems to help <clears throat> help to uh, to mitigate that. Um, and so you really need to evolve how you're doing business. As we've seen in Web3, you know, there have been lots of everything from hacks to people just committing outright fraud and criminality. Um, and I think that that's a function um, not of technology at all, but it's a function of the fact that there's a lot of value being created and, you know, criminals are attracted to money. So as long as there's value being created in this sector, it will attract a bad element as well as a good element. Um, but I think, you know, um, yeah, so anyway, sorry, that was a, I, I don't even remember the question. My answer is so long. <laughs> No, I mean, I think it's very interesting because the, the idea of guardrails is something that's long been debated because on the one hand, everyone feels entitled to this very free, open digital world, but at the same time, safeguards do need to be put in place to protect against bad actors. And I think the notion of gaming acting as a bit of a Trojan horse into these marketplaces or allowing blockchain to enter these marketplaces is very interesting because then it comes down to the question of how do you break up these monopolies if they are still the primary gatekeeper to devices as powerful and as prominent as mobile devices? Because again, it kind of loops back to what we were saying earlier about the sophistication of the gameplay isn't necessarily there yet. And also blockchain based applications aren't necessarily built mobile first yet so there's a lot of friction points that need to be overcome before and to use a controversial term we reach this principle of you know mass adoption where the technology mm -hmm. is so ubiquitous that it goes unnoticed but with all of this resistance in play it kind of makes you wonder where do we go from here i think part of the challenge is expectation management um so <clears throat> I think in the same way that if you have an experience on a very um, on a very curated closed system, so you know, full disclosure, I have an iPhone, right? And <laughs> iOS works very well. I, you know, it's my preferred mobile operating system um, because everything works and functions really well. Um, but that requires a maniacal dictatorship over content in order to do that and to facilitate that. And what hap what results is that there's a reasonably uh, high cost for developers um, to be developing on that platform. Um, there's a high cost for advertisers um, because there is, uh, for all of the people in the ecosystem, there is always a risk um, and an uncertainty associated with the fact that the platform is unilaterally controlled by one entity. And they can change the rules at any time they want. So as we've seen with the with the mobile advertising business, um, it's been thrown into huge upheaval over the last year because of changes to advertising and IDFA policies specifically um, 
on mobile platforms and particularly on on iOS. Um, and this has created, you know, the the entire industry has basically um, had to evolve and find new grounds because of a policy change at at one company. Um, and I think that that's problematic, honestly. Um, but for consumers, we've become used to the idea that everything is incredibly simple. I can download an app and two clicks later, I can purchase something. And that kind of seamless user experience is only possible in a monopoly, right? Um, and, and in the same way that they used to say that, um, what was it, that Mussolini got the trains to run on time, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you have one single measure of life in a fascist dictatorship and it's that trains run on time, then you're happy with fascism. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it leads us very tidily to this principle of, you know, the open metaverse and it's, you know, the general agreement. I think the metaverse has been a notoriously ambiguous word, or at least people have had no issue with projecting their own sort of definition <laughs> onto it. Yes, a lot of projection. A lot of projection, but there is a, I dare say, a general agreement that it's the reality that sort of spans our digital and physical world. Um, and as it relates to blockchain technology, like what are we really talking about? We've touched on interoperability. We've touched on there being no sort of monopolistic dictator or owner over the space. Mm -hmm. But what are we really saying and what are we suggesting that it gives to us as a society, you know, as it advances and as it evolves, because I think, I mean, controversially, you know, Meta sort of dominated the mindshare quite early in the space and it did yep. technically work. I mean, if you Google failure of the metaverse, Meta is the first thing that comes up because it's all about its criticisms around it as a company. Yes. So there's still a lot of education. There's a lot of untangling to do. So people don't actually lose sight of what the metaverse is fundamentally meant to stand for. But you know, mm -hmm. what is its importance? Why is this such a revolutionary concept that benefits all of us as a humanity even? Sure. I think that um, first you have to go back to definitions. So um, for Meta, the company, um, their definition of the metaverse is driven by a hardware platform that they developed, uh, which is VR, virtual reality. And so they believe that a metaverse is defined by, a, you know, a multi-user virtual reality experience. Um, I think personally that that's a extremely narrow definition of what the metaverse is. Um, and to my mind, the metaverse is actually a much broader and inclusive um, type of a concept. The metaverse to me is <clears throat> frankly not that much different from the internet. Um, and the idea behind the metaverse in my mind is that it's the, it's the aggregation of open content platforms um, that allow for the seamless exchange of both content and value and therefore users um, and that it's open because otherwise if it's closed we already have that that's the internet right and we have lots of websites and we have lots of applications and they don't talk to each other but we can you know browse to use the term of art um, from one to the next, and we just move and jump from silo to silo. To me, the metaverse underpinned by blockchain technology, because that's what allows for that seamless um, uh, uh, exchange of value and um, and identification of validity of, of content, um, because it does protect that copyright. So when you go to content, you know that's the original legitimate content. <clears throat> um, but it's the idea that those games and social media applications and what have you are going to be built on open blockchain based standards so that content can move from one place to the next so that I can, as a user, take my avatar and go from one game to the next to a, an MMO or into a social media application and everybody, I can bring that stuff with me from place to place because if I own my own digital stuff, then I shouldn't have to buy a different copy of my digital stuff in every application I go to. I should, you know, that would be like having to buy a new car for every house I own, right? It makes no sense. <laughs> you want to drive your car from one house to the next. Um, and so I would argue that even with traditional platforms like 
Facebook or Twitter, or actually, I should say Meta and X, they're not even called that anymore. <laughs> um, but traditional platforms, if they decided to open themselves up, um, then I would say they're part of the metaverse. I don't think the metaverse is defined by VR. I don't even think it's defined, defined by three dimensions. I think two-dimensional content can also be part of the metaverse, provided that it's interoperable. Because the reason we think of a metaverse is because it's an all-inclusive world where we can move around and share and interact with everybody, not just the people in our silo. And I think that's the most important concept. So when we look at, you know, this principle of interoperability and I guess digital mobility, mm -hmm. these are all down to the infrastructure of this open metaverse that, you know, technologists are seeking to create that don't necessarily need to be the concern of the end user in the same way that a casual gamer doesn't need to know that their their favorite game was built on a blockchain. But then it does beg the question of what the user experience within this space actually is and also what adoption is going to look like. Because as we touched on earlier, you know, there's a multitude of different games. There's, you know, there's casual free to play types where, you know, you've got your candy crushes where you can just sit on your commute and mm -hmm. play for hours on end without thinking too much of, you know, what NFTs you're taking away from the game that you might want to transport through this open metaverse versus the more complex storylines that, or, you know, guild games that mm -hmm. very much rely on the community of users and the people you tend to make friends with during your gameplay and like the level of importance that that carries in, you know, this, this principled idea of the metaverse. So it's kind of, it begs the question of what is it that's going to matter to the end user that we should communicate to the end user given the rest is sort of more on the infrastructural and foundational layers of all of this? Sure. I think that ultimately I would hope that these content journeys become relatively seamless um, for users. So they're not really aware of the fact of what's going on in the plumbing. Because at the end of the day, blockchain, for example, is supposed to just be the plumbing and we shouldn't really have to care anymore that like, I used to care what TCP IP was because it was really hard to get my modem to connect to the internet, but that was the <laughs> early days and we didn't have simplicity and better technology. I think we're in the same phase of blockchain adoption. Um, I think we'll be at a point a few years from now when people will forget about wallets and custody and all these other kinds of things that we worry about today because it will just work and it will be simple and straightforward. Um, and there will be options for users who just want it to work and for users who want it to work, but in a way where they can customize and tailor every single feature because some people prefer to do that. Uh, and the internet's the same. I can still tweak my TCP IP on my modem if I want, but most users just want to get online. Um, so I think that there's, there's going to be, there are going to be those options for everybody. Um, I think also, you know, we've been talking for a while about mass adoption, and I think that we have to think about mass adoption for blockchain in, in stages, because I do believe that ultimately, you know, Web3 is called Web3 for a reason. I do think it's the next incarnation of how we will get online and interact with content. And so therefore, ultimately, blockchain infrastructure will be pervasive across all applications. That's my own personal belief. Um, but I don't think that for it to reach a tipping point or to be significant, it requires us to reach milestones of user numbers of adoption to define success. And, and the reason I say that is because having come from um, a background most recently in mobile, which is defined by large user numbers like no other platform before. You know, I think, um, you know, in mobile gaming, we were accustomed to the fact that on launching an application, we would expect to have at least 15, 20 million users in the first couple of days. Otherwise, we felt like we were failures. Um, and no other kind of medium in history, I think, has ever had that kind of that kind of usage based on mass distribution. I mean, imagine opening a store in a city and expecting 20 million customers in the first week. Um, it's an insane idea. But the reason that we expected this in mobile is 
the flip side, which is monetization was atrociously small, right? My expectation of those 20 million users was that ultimately about 2000 of them would probably pay me five cents a month. And so therefore I needed 20 million of them just to try to meet my payroll. Um, and, and I needed more, more than that. I'd prefer to have a hundred or two or 300 million users in order to have a reasonably profitable game. And so because the monetization was so low, um, it became important to focus on having that incredibly large user acquisition funnel of hundreds of millions of users. Now, when we go and move to a model um, like we have in Web3, where the monetization rate is much, much higher because the value proposition to users is higher. We're giving them ownership of content. And so because they're buying things that they own, um, which have residual value, they're willing to spend more. And so as a result, we can run a successful business based on much smaller user audiences because we're selling much higher value um, products. And so I think that um, it's important when we think about what it means to have mass adoption. I think my focus would be on when do we get to a point where businesses can where where we're an attractive sector that people can come in and run profitable businesses and employ large numbers of people to make cool stuff because to me that's a sustainable industry and that's the most important metric is can i open a business making blockchain games and employ 200 people and meet my payroll because if the answer to that is yes and then another 50 companies can do that well that's an industry i mean i think you only have to look at the um the stock market when it comes to how scale has come at the expense of profit within the tech sector to understand where those pitfalls lie and why we need to adopt sort of a different set of success metrics when it comes to this space so i mean coming from Animoca brands, like what are the success metrics that you guys evaluate mm -hmm. the games and the companies within your portfolio against? So I think <clears throat> typically, I mean, user numbers are nice. It's hard to get away from thinking about monthly active users and daily active users because that defined our existence for the last decade. But I think most importantly, what we look at are um, revenue per user numbers because we want to know what our monetization rate is for users um, and retention because the one thing that has always been true in gaming, regardless of the monetization model, is that retention is the most important because if you have high retention figures, monetization will flow from that. It's interesting because also in talking about this principle of mass adoption, you know, there's also this run, long running idea of if we build it, they will come. And mm -hmm. it alludes to the eventual ubiquity of blockchain, you know, as core tech infrastructure, as we've spoken about. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, these blockchain environments also thrive because of the communities that actually championed them um, before necessarily the sophistication of the technology that they rest on. So, you know, there's this complex interdependency between, you know, the tech, the users and the liquidity that kind of greases its wheels. So it's very interesting to understand how all of these connect with each other, because essentially one of the risks that come with the space is that your tech can be the most sophisticated, but if the community of users aren't as loud and as bullish and as aggressive in support of the products that are being, are being built on it, they kind of run the <clears> risk <throat> of falling by the wayside, which is what makes gaming so interesting because I guess you can't really escape the typical metrics that would make a game highly successful because at the end of the day, it relies on the people who enjoy it and are entertained by it. Yes. Although I think that the thing that's exciting about building in Web3 is that we don't, um, you're not relying just upon the same levers that you were in traditional games. Um, and the idea of building in a web three environment means that we're all, we're all building open. And so there are many things that end up getting shared in our infrastructure. And you mentioned liquidity and liquidity is one of them. So, you know, one of the reasons that Ethereum has the biggest and strongest community in web three, um, you know, well, aside from Bitcoin, but Bitcoin's kind of a one, let, let's call it a single or dual use case, um, you know, purpose, but I'd say, the reason for the incredible vibrancy of Ethereum is because 
there's a lot of liquidity there as well um, because it has the biggest DeFi community as well as the biggest game community and the biggest art community, et cetera. And all of those different um, communities that are using the infrastructure for different reasons um, can actually still uh, share not just the infrastructure of the plumbing, but the infrastructure of liquidity as well. Um, and that's really important. Um, and, <clears throat> and so I think that um, as we continue to build out um, in blockchain, we can really benefit from the idea that we can work together with those other diverse applications. To me, the most exciting bit of building a game in Web3 is not just that I can interoperate content with other games, but that my players can take advantage of other non-gaming applications. So they can take my in-game items and go to a, a, you know, a lending protocol and borrow money to buy more in-game items or to pledge their in-game items as assets for a, for a loan. Um, that's really cool. Like, and, and, and the best part is because they're built on open standards, Number one, I don't have to build those other services, but number two, other people will continue to build services we haven't even dreamed of yet to take advantage of the NFTs that we create in our games. And that's actually the most exciting innovation. Because if you think about it, you know, the, the, the people who thought up ride sharing, you know, they came up with Uber and Lyft and they came up with, you know, paint shops and service stations, all of these businesses arose around the invention of the automobile, but they didn't need Ford and BMW and Mercedes-Benz to invent them for them. They didn't have to ask permission of them. They just invented services and businesses because of the pure existence of the automobile. I mean, I think it touches on a very interesting point as it relates to the evolution of an in-game economy and how that goes to melt into the digital economy at large and then just the conventional economy on a global scale and how the lines between those services or those activities get increasingly blurred. Cause I don't think we'd ever encountered a universe before in which, you know, the, the street value of your game skin can yield mm -hmm. a profit that can then gen like be used to be invest into a lending protocol to generate more profit. And like that, that's an entire world that's quite difficult to fathom because it also goes to it also goes to show that gaming activity itself will evolve in ways that I don't think we're able to fully predict predict and fully grasp at this point in time or at this point of development, um, which means there's a lot that remains to be seen. And I think I mean one thing that one area that I really want to dig into before we leave this conversation, which mm -hmm. is something we touched on earlier, is. Asia as a region, because we spoke briefly about Asia's dominance in mobile gaming. There's a lot of press about how many, um, many journalists are predicting that Asia will be the blockchain market or it will, it will advance faster than the US and Europe. Uh, Anamoka is obviously Asia based. You guys are headquartered in Hong Kong. I'm mm -hmm. in Singapore. I feel like, you know, many often overlook how quickly Asia's blockchain and gaming industry actually is advancing, mm -hmm. whether it is relating to the development of the technology or its adoption rates. So, you know, can you shed some light based on your insights on what the ecosystem within this region looks like as compared with the U S and Europe? Sure. Um, so I think, first and foremost, I think we can't have this conversation at this moment in time without talking about regulation. Um, and I think that this is something that is um, top of mind for a lot of people um, in Web3, um, particularly because of what's been going on in the US market over the last month or so. Um, obviously, the US uh, SEC came out with, with lawsuits against Binance and Coinbase. Um, and I think that spooked a lot of US-based Web3 companies. Um, just because I think it has a chilling effect on innovation, frankly. Um, it doesn't, it, you know, there are lawsuits, there's no resolution, there's no regulation. There's, it's just, it's just, um, an atmosphere of uncertainty and, and that generates that chilling effect. Um, we then had that followed by an actual court judgment, um, with regards to the ripple case. Um, and I think that provided some comfort um, not necessarily in the end 
result of the judgment itself, but just in the fact that it provides clarity of some sort on certain aspects of questions that people were thinking about in Web3 when it comes to regulation. Um, and so with that sort of um, atmosphere going on in the US, we have at the same time um, a lot of, I think, forward momentum in Asia. Um, and we've seen that in um, Hong Kong and China over the last couple of, well, over the last six or nine months. Um, so Hong Kong has been very, very proactive now in the post-COVID period um, of embracing Web3 um, from a from a government standpoint. Um, they've authorized the um, retail trading of baskets of different kinds of cryptocurrencies that are approved for retail trading. They've talked about creating a Hong Kong dollar-backed stablecoin, um, and they're actively courting Web3 companies to come and, and locate in Hong Kong and saying, look, you know, come to Hong Kong, not just because it's a great place to do business, but because we're going to be very clear in how we treat companies operating in Web3, whether it's in content or financial services, et cetera, and we're providing a clear framework for that. And I think that's something the industry desires. Um, <clears throat> in addition, China has now started to, to be, I think, a little bit more um, uh, open about discussing things like how it feels about Bitcoin and other things. And, and while the trading of cryptocurrencies is still ostensibly not permitted in China, um, I think China has um, been open about the fact that they are fine with that kind of activity taking place in Hong Kong as the designated location within China for that kind of activity. So I think that's great. Um, and the other thing that we've seen now over the last week um, is uh, there was a, you know, a great conference called WebEx in Japan um, taking place over the last few days. And we've seen the Japanese government now uh, also starting to engage much more proactively in really trying to uh, embrace Web3 and um, and facilitate um, its own uh, Web3 industries development. Um, and obviously places like, like Singapore, where you are, have been embracing Web3 for a long time already. So I think, frankly, in my view, Asia is kind of where most of the action is um, at the moment. Um, and, uh, and within the game industry specifically, I would say it's always been relatively evenly split between Asian and Western markets. They've tended to have slightly different content preferences um, and often, and, and of course, different um, consumer interests. But in terms of the overall game industry, just measured by revenues, um, for example, um, it's been relatively evenly split between Nor North America, Europe, um, you know, versus East Asia. I, mean, I think it's very interesting because obviously most recently, you know, the Anamoka co-founder Yatsu himself was appointed to Hong Kong's Web3 task force. So I think there is a clear indication about, you know, the, the different attitudes towards blockchain and crypto and I do think there is a sort of split attitudes toward uh, blockchain development as a core technology versus the cryptocurrency layer that sits atop it. So while I think there's a lot of regulation that's yet to be teased out as to how these economies or these governments want to engage with cryptocurrency specifically, mm -hmm. what has never showed there has never really been clear displays of hesitation about what blockchain technology can actually do within these economies. And I think as is very typical of, you know, Asia or at least the Southeast Asian region is that there is this propensity for leapfrogging that I think we are most likely going to see again mm -hmm. in the near future as, you know, as this technology yep. becomes a lot more sophisticated, which has a lot of implications for, um, I guess the tech race between, different regions of the world and i think i think i think there's a lot of uncertainty around it i think it's very difficult to place your bets because i think everyone despite regulatory restrictions haven't really slowed down in building they've just gotten a little bit quieter and perhaps steadier about it mm -hmm. but it kind of it kind of begs the question of what sort of future we're going to look at and who's really going to take charge and really building and advancing this open metaverse that animoca is so Sure. dedicated to advancing so i think that <clears throat> um to kind of loosely generalize um i find that um you know asian markets in general tend to be full of um more early adopters than western markets um, when it comes to this kind of technology and so blockchain um and the tokenization of content and things like that all i think fall under the early adopter spectrum 
Um, so as a result, I think we're going to see um, faster traction amongst mainstream audiences in Asia because people are just willing to, you know, try new things. Um, as, as a friend of mine um, who's originally from Scandinavia uh, and runs one of the most successful game companies in the world likes to, likes to say, he said, if you, if you want to see what the future lo looks like, just go, go to Korea. Um, he said, because they're easily five years ahead of the rest of us. Um, and, and I think that, you know, what we see in Asia is a lot more willingness to experiment amongst consumers, meaning they see something new, they see a new blockchain game, they're like, that's interesting. What's that? Let me download a wallet. Let me try it. Why not? And that's why I think we saw a huge amount of um, uh, adoption in the early days of Web3 applications from <clears throat> um, things like uh, play to earn gaming and GameFi and all kinds of new innovations that were greeted, I think, with a little bit of skepticism from Western gamers initially. Um, but in Asia, people are just much more open to experimentation. And I think that that's going to lead to earlier adoption. With all that said, I do have one final question, which is mm -hmm. probably simpler than some of the questions that I've asked here today, which is generally, what are the plans for Animoca brand? Animoca brand? What, like, what is on the road that lies ahead? Hmm. Um, good question. I think that our focus is on bringing digital property rights to gamers. That's number one. Um, and I think that in, and, and the idea also of trying to play our part in building the open metaverse is not to say that we want to build the metaverse. Um, I don't, I think that's far too ambitious. Um, but I think what we want to do is we want to try to use whatever platform we have to encourage people to focus on the part, the open part. So when the metaverse is built, we think it should be open because if it's not, then to us, that's kind of not the metaverse and that's not taking advantage of the potential of the innovation that we have before us um, because we don't, we feel like we don't want to fall into the mistakes of the past, if we will. Um, and so what we want to do is encourage people to build open and interoperable. And we think that this revolution of property owner, digital property ownership will actually have, um, ramifications across the spectrum. Gaming will be a big part of that, but it will also have big implications in everything from financial services to education to government, you name it. Um, and so you'll see actually in our portfolio of investees that we've invested in many companies that are not just in gaming, but also in other adjacent sectors, because we feel that there will be implications there. And that when we think about building in an open environment, um, as I was talking to you earlier about <clears throat> in terms of interoperability of content and liquidity and such, um, these different sectors do relate to each other in Web3 in ways that they did not in Web2 when applications were siloed. So there is an expectation now in Web3 that we have the possibility of having e-government services and therefore a tokenized, you know, citizenship or identity, which can then be used for, you know, Web3 based financial services and KYC to represent ourselves, which can then be used to borrow money to go and spend in games, which can be used to buy digital art, like all of these things work together in a Web3 context. And so I think that's why we've also tried to take an investing strategy to invest broadly across the space and to encourage that open and interoperable environment because that to us is at the end of the day, the true innovation, the idea that we can take the, the spirit of the open source movement that's been you know, best illustrated in things like Linux, for example, and actually add tremendous innovation to software development and technology and humanity through collaborating with each other rather than trying to compete with each other. So gaming really is one of the first steps into like into building this very elaborate and complex and interrelated world. And it's, it's a privilege to know that there are so many bright minds that are working on it. And I think a lot of people who are going to be listening to this episode are, are going to keep a, like a keen eye on Animoca brands and seeing what, is to come out over the near future and, you know, in the long term as well. Um, 
Robbie, I really want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us on Glitchwire. I think this has been a fascinating conversation. I think we've touched on a lot of ground and it's going to take a bit of time to digest all of it and really distill those ideas. So thank you so much for joining me today. No problem.